All right, I'm gonna jump in with um, my announcements and the library announcements. Welcome to the San Francisco Public Library Virtual Library. I am Anissa and I'm your librarian today. We'll be throwing some info in the chat, including links to library news, my email, and links to all of Linda's um, events and socials and websites and where you can get her book. So yes, today you are here for our summer stride with author Linda Shu and her new book, Spice Box Kitchen. Uh, this is summer stride and we are midway through summer and we have many more programs to come. If you haven't signed up for your summer stride reading challenge, we encourage you to do so to grab that iconic SFPL tote bag and it will feature this beautiful art from Kehlani Juanita. The circle image right there is what is on the tote bag. We wanna welcome you to the unceded land of the Ohlone tribal people and acknowledge the many Ramutish Ohlone tribal groups and families as the rightful stewards of the lands on which we reside here in our Bay Area. Our library is committed to uplifting the names of these lands and community members. And we do this by providing factual and useful information, hosting events, and I will provide a link in the chat box that has a link to a resource and reading list. We have some great events coming up. We have many literary campaigns at the library, and this is our newest, featuring Heather Knight and Peter Hartlob, part of the Chronicle, and their initiative is called Total SF. And we now have a Total SF book club. The second book will be The End of Golden Gate and writers talking about loving San Francisco, loving and sometimes leaving San Francisco. And they'll be having Daniel Handler and Gary Kamaya, and those will be quarterly. So we'll have one in November and one in February. Those are both scheduled for in-person events starting November. Our other literary campaign is called On the Same Page, where we feature a bi-monthly read and encourage all of San Francisco to read the same book. And we are celebrating Jacqueline Woodson and her book, Red at the Bone. Jacqueline Woodson will be in the library, virtual library, August, I want to say August 12th. Um, and she'll be talking about her YA books and her children's books at that time. Um, she's a prolific uh, youth writer and children's book author. So come hear her speak, come read this book. And it's, uh, the book is an adult book. It's very good. We'll also have a book club. Uh, tomorrow, the Northern California Book Awards, so a house full of virtual life, a virtual house full of authors, and this is going to be fun. On Tuesday, we have rock and roll, so Jonathan Taplin in conversation with Grail Marcus. Uh, this is going to be a fun one. And now I'm going to speed things up because we do have a lot of things happening, especially this week. Our COVID Command Center Artists and Residents will be speaking um, coming up later next week, we have, I don't know if you know, the San Francisco Public Library has a jail and reentry services department, which services all the jails in San Francisco, as well as reference by mail for every jail west of the Mississippi, and um, also focuses a lot on helping folks reenter and getting acclimated. And it's a huge department, and I'm, it's not a huge department, physically like, you know, there's two people, but the work they do is huge. And I'm so proud of all the work they do. And so we have authors coming up talking about reentry and lots of stuff, lots of stuff. Like you can see to check out all of our events, you can go to sfpl.org slash events. And this is also a JARS program that I wanted to highlight a film screening and panel discussion afterwards. And our friend Troy Williams there at the end, he is a San Franciscan and has does a lot of stuff for just social uh, reform and social justice. So please come out for our JARS programs. Um, July 31st, Herbs and Edible Gardening. I know you're all gonna love that. <clears throat> all right, so on with today's show. And today we are here to see Linda Shu and her book, Spice Box Kitchen. Eat well and be healthy with globally inspired vegetable forward recipes. Um, after Linda took her first French cooking class at age seven, it was almost 40 years before she finally went to culinary school at San Francisco's cooking school. 
In between, she studied anthropology and medicine at Brown with fieldwork in rural Sichuan, China and Singapore. She continued her medical training at the University of California, San Francisco, and learned about plant-based nutrition at Cornell University. She is an enthusiastic eater inspires, and inspires strangers to copy her order at restaurants and for chefs to send her a little something special. Uh, we, want to be, we all want to be your friend, Linda. <laughs> um, Linda is a practicing physician in San Francisco, and she also founded a popular vegetable forward teaching kitchen to inspire people to cook for health. And we encourage you all to check out her book from the library, or you can purchase it from Omnivore and get it signed. And we will put all of these links into the box, the chat box. You, we will also have time for Q&A today, which please use the Q&A function. And that is it. Everyone, please welcome Linda Shu. Thank you so much, Anissa, for that introduction. And welcome, everybody. I'm so excited that so many of you have decided to spend part of your Saturday morning with me. Um, and so um, I'm also very excited to be doing a library presentation. Public libraries have been part of my life forever. And I was always a very enthusiastic participant in programs like Summer Strides. So um, this is really an exciting event for me. Wish it could be in person, um, but I'm also glad to reach more of you through this virtual forum. Um, so today um, I'll be talking about my somewhat unusual path from being a doctor to becoming a trained chef and writing a cookbook. I'll be talking about what I consider to be healthy cooking and healthy eating, uh, take you for a walk through my cookbook, Spicebox Kitchen, and I'll also be doing a cooking demonstration with one of the recipes from the cookbook, which is called Backpackers Gado Gado. And um, Anissa and Alan will be sharing the link for the recipe, which has been excerpted in a recent issue of Eating Well magazine, so that you can all make this recipe um, even before you get the cookbook. Um, so that's the format for today, and um, we'll have plenty of time for questions at the end. So please um, write down your questions as we go, and we'll have a chance to talk about them later. Um, so in addition to the little background that um, Anissa gave uh, to my introduction, um, I'll just sort of summarize that and that I've always been um, a lover of food and very curious about um, different cuisines and cultures around the world. I grew up on Long Island, New York in a pretty uh, semi-rural area, but it was near a, a national laboratory, uh, which is why my family was there. My parents were research scientists. And uh, the bonus of that was that we would have these potlucks um, periodically with visitors from around the world. So there were visiting scientists. And um, that really, you know, gave me a lot of exposure early on and I think developed my palate and my curiosity. Um, so I just saw something in the chat that people can't see the video. I hope that you can. Um, but um, first I'm going to be reading an excerpt from my introduction, which will tell you a little bit more about how I got to this point of deciding that teaching people how to cook deliciously should be part of my medical practice. So this is a, a brief excerpt that I'll read. Eating well is about food and health, but equally also about celebration and community. There is a world of flavor and the passport is spices. I connected my lifelong love of food and cooking to my work as a physician 10 years ago when I attended a medical conference that transformed the way I practice medicine um, after a whole decade as a primary care physician. At that time, I was feeling a little burnt out. I knew that I was helping my patients, but I didn't feel that I was making an impact in the way I really wanted. Despite my support and advice, my patients struggled to lose weight, to control their cholesterol and blood pressure and blood sugar, and they were tired, anxious, and depressed. I wrote many prescriptions for cholesterol medications, blood pressure medications, diabetes medications, and for antidepressants and sleep aids. My patients didn't feel better and I felt ineffectual. Then I went to a fateful medical conference called Healthy Kitchens, Healthy Lives, which is co-sponsored by the Harvard School of Public Health and the Culinary Institute of America. And this is held in Napa. 
Uh, we review the latest updates in nutrition science and how this knowledge could help patients. We're also taught to cook incredibly delicious food that was also health supportive by the culinary school's chefs. That was my light bulb moment. My practice changed immediately. Before, at the end of routine physical examinations, I would review my findings with the patient, discuss their weight, blood pressure, and lab results, and make some vague su suggestions for modifying their diet and exercise routines. Typically, it would have ended there. But after my epiphany with my next patient, I pulled out my prescription pad and wrote a recipe for kale chips. And a week after that conference ended, I taught my first cooking class to patients and I was hooked. I began teaching cooking classes on a regular basis and felt as exhilarated as my students were. I shifted my practice to include culinary medicine, a new evidence-based field that blends the art of food and cooking with the science of nutrition and medicine. And I did this because essentially food is medicine. 75% of what we see in the office are chronic diseases and these are preventable or at least um, made better, um, made less severe by paying attention to nutrition. And I thought, well, you know, nutrition is one thing, but what, what do we eat? We don't eat nutrition, we eat food. So I decided that incorporating, teaching people how to cook should be part of my practice. And it's low cost, access, accessible, and culturally adaptable. And as I was telling Anissa and Alan um, from the library at the beginning of uh, this presentation, I did my first presentations in public libraries. Um, at that time, I was working on the peninsula. And so I'm even more grateful to how public libraries have played a role in this and in my ability to reach many people uh, with culinary medicine education. I'm just going to read a little bit more and then I'll move on to tell you more about this book. Uh, so this cookbook, Spicebox Kitchen, shares my love for flavors from around the world from my unique perspective and nutrition knowledge as a physician and professionally trained chef. Whereas most, most uh, so-called healthy cookbooks focus on nutrition over flavor, these recipes celebrate eating for pleasure. At my table, food is meant to be savored. I won't prescribe you a diet, advise you to count calories, or tell you what to eat. I believe that our food choices should be personal. The best diet for one person may not be the best for another. I do recommend that everyone eat mostly plants for many reasons, including taste, variety, the environment, ethical concerns, and of course, health. My goal as a physician is to improve patients' health by inspiring them to cook more and eat more vegetables. My goal as a cooking instructor and recipe developer is to get people to love and crave vegetables by showing them the many ways to prepare them deliciously. And so that's really the essence of what this book is about. Um, Anissa, if you could uh, go to the next slide, please. Great, so this is a picture, uh, I meant to actually show this, I forgot, um, as I was reading the excerpt, but this is a picture of uh, masala daba, which is uh, the Hindi word for spice box um, used in India, which I named my cookbook after. And as you can see, it's a really handy way to keep your favorite spices um, at close proximity when you're cooking. Um, and because it's um, already in a metal container, it's a great way to preserve the flavor of your spices, protect them from light. So just a few uh, hints on the best way to store your spices. Um, and as you can see, the spices are very colorful and that is a testament to all the antioxidants that they contain. Um, so the reason why I feature spices in this book so much is that they are not just for flavor, but they were our first medicine. In, in fact, they were used as medicine. Um, and these days you can find some spices, um, most notably turmeric, but a few other spices as well, sold in pill form. But I really want you to, to encourage you to actually enjoy them in your food and um, to incorporate them that way. Um, and in so doing, get some of the health benefits, but also just really enjoy them and have them as a way to explore different cuisines around the world and to enhance the flavor of your cooking. Um, so spices are really key. Um, and I'll be using, featuring one spice in today's recipe, which is ginger. And I'll talk a little bit more about ginger when we get to the cooking demo. Um, so I think at this point, I'm going to walk you through the book a little bit. Um, next slide, please. Great. Um, so 
Uh, the first section of my book is called Healthy Cooking 101. I'm going to show you um, that page in the book here. Oops, Healthy Cooking 101, as you can see that right there. This section is actually a big, you know, it's probably 25% of the book. And this is where I try to distill a lot of the nutrition education um, and guide to cooking um, and cooking techniques, um, kind of hints about meal planning that I'd share in my cooking classes, uh, which I hold at Kaiser Permanente San Francisco in Mission Bay, um, currently virtual. Um, and those are once a month cooking classes. I know that not everybody can come to those classes, although for the rest of this year, while they're virtual and maybe um, in the future as well, um, hopefully more of you can access those. But if not, um, the first section of this book, Healthy, Kitchen, uh, Healthy Cooking 101, goes over a lot of the things that I teach in my classes. Um, and then one of those things is what are the best things to incorporate into your diets, whether you're an omnivore or a vegetarian or completely plant based. I actually think that everybody's diets would benefit most from having the next three ingredients which are going to highlight. So the first is legumes, as you can see here, there is a wide variety of legumes out there beans and lentils and many other things that are made from those, including tofu and tempeh. All of these things are great sources of protein as well as fiber um, and antioxidants and many nutrients. And I encourage all of you to incorporate more of those into your diets. Next slide, please. So another picture of legumes, and you can see, again, the wide variety of sizes, shapes, uh, which corresponds to flavors as well and textures. Next slide, please. The second category of must have ingredients that I encourage you to have in your diets are leafy greens. Um, and uh, this is a green that I have pictured here that may not be that familiar to many of you. So I encourage you to, for all of you to guess, if any of you know what this is, to put that in the chat. Um, so leafy greens come in many shapes, sizes, and flavors. And if you visit farmers markets, you know, to give a shout out to my favorite local farmers market, it's the Alamany Farmers Market, which is um, going on right now, um, every Saturday morning, every, every Saturday of the year, where you'll see farmers who come from um, many, and heart of the city, sorry about that, <laughs> as well as heart of the city, um, many different um, parts, growing vegetables from many parts of the world and many cultures. And this is a great way to not only um, increase your repertoire and make greens less, you know, kind of less, um, I guess, standard from what you get in the grocery store, um, but also to get a wider variety of antioxidants and other nutrients, because every leafy green has a different uh, nutrition profile. Um, so uh, please explore your greens. Um, the next slide has some other greens that might be more familiar to you, um, but you may not think of as a leafy green, um, but this is uh, these are Brussels sprouts. And this is from a recipe in, in the book for what I call gateway Brussels sprouts, because that recipe actually makes Brussels sprouts uh, non-enthusiasts into people who love them and want every last bit. Um, so I don't know if there was uh, a correct answer because my uh, chat is a little bit too far for me for the first one, um, but that is taro leaf, other, otherwise known as, I think some, I did see someone guess elephant ear. I think that is actually the same vegetable um, and also known as Kalaloo. Those are, there are many other names of that. Um, it's a little bit harder to get. You may find it in a farmer's market. You can find it in a larger Asian grocery. Um, still a little bit hard to find, but um, and uh, you can find that in places that use taro root. So um, Hawaii, someone just listed as a place for that. And that is one of the places. Many of us are more familiar with the taro root that's used um, in cooking, but the leaves are great. If you can't find that, you can substitute a spinach for many recipes, including one that I have in the cookbook. So leafy greens are the second category. Um, next slide, please for our final category of must have to make your diets healthier and more interesting and delicious are whole grains. Um, this is a recipe from the cookbook for uh, Jamaican um, rice and peas um, using a rice cooker in this case. Um, next slide. And this is another recipe from the cookbook for um, a Turkish inspired bulgur pilaf. 
Um, so there are so many whole grains out there. Um, if you want to learn more about them, um, you can read about them in my book in terms of how to cook them, what some um, highlighted grains are. But there's also a great uh, nonprofit called the Whole Grains Council. And they have a website, um, which is called wholegrainscouncil.org, where you can uh, learn everything you always want to know about whole grains. So whole grains, as opposed to refined or you know white grains like white rice, white wheat, etc., cetera, um, contain a lot more nutrients and a lot more fiber. So you'll get B vitamins, uh, you'll get um, you'll get potassium, you'll get magnesium, you'll get iron, uh, depending on the grain, and fiber. And fiber is something that is in common with all of these three categories of foods that I've just mentioned. So um, legumes, leafy greens, and whole grains all have fiber. And that is something which uh, most people are actually a little bit deficient in, in their diet. So, um, you know, trust me, I'm actually a doctor. <laughs> um, or if you incorporate more of these, regardless of how you eat, you will improve your health. So fiber is not just for your digestion and improving that, but it's also important in preventing chronic diseases. Um, it ends up being anti-inflammatory. And so um, just you can't go wrong by incorporating these three ingredients into your diet. Um, and so now I'm going to take you through what the book showcases in terms of recipes. You know, that's a little bit of the nutrition portion. Um, the, the other remaining portions of the book are all just like a regular cookbook recipes. And these come from four parts of the world uh, that I chose because I have a personal connection to all of them. Um, and they also have healthy diets in their kind of original form that incorporate a lot of spices. Next slide, please. Um, oh, I forgot. So this is a picture of the recipe I'm demonstrating. This is the backpackers gato gato, which I chose and made into kind of a more colorful form from the original, um, because it's a way of showcasing this very important nutrition point of eating the rainbow. So you can see it looks very beautiful. You have all the colors there, um, but also different colors correspond to different nutrients and antioxidants. So you don't even really have to think about um, you know, are you getting all your nutrients if you incorporate as many colors of vegetables and fruits into your diet? Um, and now we'll move into the different sections of the book. Next slide, please. So first, California. So these recipes are inspired by uh, San Francisco, where we are based here, and I've lived for the last 20 plus years. Um, and which is a place which I really think inspired my cooking a lot. Um, so these two recipes in the book um, are from that first section featuring California. The first um, is California oranges with ginger in um, a recipe for oatmeal. It also features pistachios. And the one on the right is a recipe for, um, uh, from, from the breakfast section of that book as well for chilaquiles, um, in this case using tomatillos. And this is inspired very locally by my neighbors next door. He used to make chilaquiles for us uh, quite often. Um, next slide, please. The next section is Asia. It's one of the larger uh, sections of the book um, because partially it's from my heritage as a Taiwanese American, um, but also because I studied abroad and traveled a lot in Southeast Asia. Um, so these two recipes here, um, one is for a slightly healthier version of the very popular uh, Chinese or Taiwanese scallion pancakes. Um, in this case, in which I substitute some of the regular white flour with whole wheat flour. Um, and then on, and that, that recipe incorporates um, some spices as well, um, including Sichuan peppercorns. The other recipe is for what I call a celebration red salad. Um, and that incorporates lots of different shades of red vegetables. It's really delicious, has a lot of different textures. It's one of my favorite recipes in the book as well. Um, then we'll move on to the next section. Next section is on the Mediterranean and the Middle East. Um, my connection to this region of the world is um, probably less personal and um, more professional, I should say, than the other regions that I feature. Uh, the Mediterranean diet is one of the best studied diets in the world, or I should say eating patterns um, in the world that has um, you know, a great impact on reducing chronic disease, including heart disease, stroke, certain cancers um, and diabetes. And so it's a really healthy eating pattern for people. Um, 
the Mediterranean geographically includes the countries of the Middle East, which use a lot of spices. And I was very lucky that during my um, culinary school years, year, uh, six months actually at San Francisco Cooking School locally, um, I got to do my externship at Murad, um, which is a modern California Moroccan restaurant um, right here in San Francisco, right near SF MoMA. Um, and so I learned a lot about spices there. And so um, those are the two reasons why I featured the Mediterranean um, spices, um, my connection to learning about it, and just the fact that it's a very healthy diet. Diet. And then the final section um, comes from Trinidad, which I know is going to be new to a lot of you here. Um, you know, we don't have that many people from the Caribbean here. Um, I married a man from Trinidad, so that's how I got to learn um, this cuisine um, very intimately, learning how to cook the food that he grew up with. And um, what I did was I took a lot of the Trinidadian recipes, which tend to be pretty meat heavy, and I made them um, either vegetarian or pescatarian, um, which I think like in many cultures actually brings our modern diets back to their more original roots. Um, so, you know, so with all these different cuisines around the world and, and the others that I didn't include in the book, um, a lot of them are, you know, as the, the way people eat them now are not as healthy because of basically modernization and, you know, the way that we've actually made a lot of food processed. So if you take home no other nutrition message from my talk today than this, try to cook as much as you can at home. That was you know, the other reason why I wrote this book. I think no matter what you cook, where it comes from, what ingredients you use, if you're cooking from scratch, you're automatically going to be improving your diet compared to, you know, eating out, compared to buying processed packaged foods. Um, it's going to be much lower in saturated fat. It'll be lower in salt. Um, it'll be lower in added sugar. And certainly you won't be adding preservatives to your own food. So no matter what you cook, uh, try to uh, cook at home, try to cook from whole ingredients as much as possible, meaning things that basically look as close as they can to how they were grown, um, things that don't have many steps in the, in the processing before they get to you. Um, and that will be kind of the best way to improve your diets. Um, so um, this brings us to the kind of the fun part, which if we could be in person, uh, you know, would be even more fun because you could, you could hear, smell, and taste what I'm going to demonstrate to you. Um, but we'll make do with what we have and um, with the recipe that I've included in the chat for this backpackers gado gado, you can recreate this at home. Um, so I'm going to spend about the next 10 to 15 minutes going over these ingredients, which I pre-prepped for this so that we would have time to go over it um, and talk about some of the nutrients benefits of those. Um, and then you can make it later at home. So um, I'm just going to read just one more bit of, about the, or tell you a little bit more about this recipe. It's called Backpackers Gato Gato because uh, when I studied abroad in Singapore many, many years ago uh, when I was in college, um, I spent some time backpacking because that was my budget around Southeast Asia. And um, one of the favorite places that I went to was Indonesia. Um, and that's where Gato Gato is from. It's basically a a salad. Um, typically, it doesn't have all these colorful ingredients. Um, and as I mentioned before, I wanted to demonstrate eating the rainbow. Um, it's basically a salad that is dressed with a coconut and peanut based dressing. And um, it's just like one of my favorite things that are just very simple, taught me different things about texture and flavor and kind of the key elements that make um, a dish kind of more interesting, delicious and fun to eat. And so um, it, it's combined of different raw and cooked vegetables. And in my recipe, I uh, wrote it actually the version in the cookbook, which is different from the one that I shared with Eating Well, um, because they wanted actually a formal recipe with measurements. Um, in the cookbook, I kind of say, you know, use what you have. And I think that's another good hint to use what you have in your pantry, what you, what you like. It's a way of reducing food waste. Um, and mixing and matching so that you don't feel that cooking is this hard thing, that you have to make it perfect. This is a way that you can just kind of throw together what you have with a few key elements. Um, and that using some cooked and some raw vegetables is a way of uh, kind of maximizing nutrition and also making um, the flavor and texture uh, more interesting. And I wanted to be able to talk about different cooking techniques for vegetables with you today. So I'll show you what we're gonna put together. Um, and as you can see here, I have all all arrayed kind of in the Roy G. Biv of the rainbow. So we have some tomato here, 
this is raw. Um, so uh, for the, our red color here, uh, tomatoes are a great source of uh, lycopene. And actually you'll get more lycopene, which is a heart healthy antioxidant if you have cooked tomatoes, but you, there's also lycopene when you have them raw, in raw form. And um, I don't think the cooked tomatoes would be uh, great in this salad recipe. Um, so we have our tomatoes. We have carrots, which I julienned. And there's a section of the cookbook on how to julienne, um, actually on knife skills in general. And so, um, you know, it's just a really nice way to have pretty looking carrots um, that are easy to chew um, and they, they look festive. Um, so carrots contain beta carotene. That's the antioxidant that um, are named after carrots actually. Um, and also um, our source of vitamin A, good for your eyesight. Next, we have some bean sprouts. I've been talking about beans or legumes a lot. So these are sprouted from green mung beans and um, they're, you know, equally a source, just like the original bean, of fiber um, and of protein and a lot of other nutrients. I have, an, um, so this row is all raw, um, some shredded green cabbage. So cabbage as a cruciferous vegetable is a great source of antioxidants and a lot of, um, you know, uh, plant phytonutrients or plant nutrients, um, as well as fiber and a lot of vitamins and minerals, um, vitamin K, which is important for blood clotting, um, B vitamins, which is important for your brain health, um, for your mood, also for heart health, and many, many others. Um, next we have, um, so these are actually long beans and I'm just gonna show you what they look like in case you're not familiar with them because they're really fun and they're in season now. So this is what long beans look like. They're also called snake beans, I believe, yard beans, because they can get to be you know, one yard long. Um, and you know they come in this light shade, which I have here. They come also in a darker green. Um, you can definitely get these in any uh, supermarket that sells uh, Asian groceries. You can definitely get them at any farmer's market and they're really fun. Um, I just love the shape of them and how they're kind of bouncy like this. Um, and what I did with these is that I blanched them. So I want to talk about blanching as a way of cooking vegetables to maintain some texture and also their green color. Blanching just involves boiling a large quantity of water, a large volume of water, and to add salt to it. So you get a little bit of salt as it's cooking. And then you just cook it for really just a few minutes until it's just a little bit wilted, but still has some of its crunch. And then you take it out immediately and either run it under a cold run water until it's completely cool or put it into an ice bath which is basically half water and half ice and that will stop the cooking process and maintain again the cooking texture that you've left it at as well as the color. Um, so these are the same beans here. They actually look a little bit darker you can see here after I've blanched them. Um, we have some cucumbers. These are raw. Cucumbers, um, just kind of a fun, fun nutrition fact with cucumbers uh, is that they contain silica, which is a mineral that we uh, don't get from many other parts of our diet and that's good for your hair, skin and nails. So it's actually a common thing that people come in to see me for is about, you know, not being happy with the texture or uh, health of their hair, skin and nails. Cucumbers would be a good thing for that as well. And then uh, the final vegetable ingredient of this recipe is red cabbage. So I'm gonna show you both the raw form where it looks a little bit more red and what it looks like after steaming where it looks purple, which is kind of fun too. So the purple or red in any vegetable that you see comes from an antioxidant called anthocyanins. Um, and you know, I've been talking a lot about antioxidants. What are they for? These are all the things that actually, you know, as the anti, combat oxidation, which is basically the stress on our bodies and our on our health that comes from multiple things in our diets. It can come from eating fried foods. It can come from eating processed foods. It can come from eating animal-based products. Um, it can come from stress in our lives. So these are all stresses on our bodies that antioxidants can help combat. And over the long term, antioxidants can help prevent chronic diseases. And so that's why it's important to, to have all these things. Antioxidants are not contained at all in animal products. They are only found in plants. So, um, so at any rate, anthocyanins are the antioxidants in red and purple colored vegetables. And steaming, um, which you can do very simply with any, you know, steamer insert and put in any pot that it fits into is a really great way to cook your vegetables. 
people often ask me, what is the best way to eat vegetables? Is it raw? Is it cooked? Um, and you know, the answer is a little bit of both. Like, you know, as I mentioned, uh, cooking can enhance the absorption of some nutrients like the lycopene from tomatoes, um, but it can also um, kill off some of the nutrition. Uh, vitamin C, for example, is one vitamin that is uh, quickly destroyed by heat. And so you want a little bit of both. Eat your salads, eat your cooked vegetables. If you cook your vegetables, um, the tips are to cook them for as brief a point, uh, brief a time as possible. And that's why blanching and steaming are two good ways and um, with as little uh, water as possible, unless you're having it in a soup, in which case all of it remains in your soup. Um, so these are the vegetable ingredients that will go into our gado gado. Um, and so I'm just gonna assemble it now and then um, show you how to make the dressing for it. So I'm going to move this to a platter. Excuse me, as my head is cut off as I'm trying to move things around here for you. Um, I know what I'll do here. Let me move the tray instead. And I'm gonna plate these ingredients on this platter here and show you the two proteins that I'm including on this salad. So this is a salad that can be eaten as, uh, you know, simply a starter, or you can have it um, as, if you add some protein, as a light lunch, which is why I chose it for today. So um, forgive me again, I'm gonna cut off my head a little bit so you can see the platter more directly, and then I'll, I'll come back and talk to you. Um, so we have our shredded green cabbage, we have our blanched, long beans here. And you can certainly substitute regular string beans too. That would be fine. Um, I'm gonna add here our julienne raw carrots. Our bean sprouts. Cucumbers. and our steamed red cabbage. And as I was mentioning before, this is all very mix and match. You can you know, add more of what you like, uh, take away what you don't like or you don't have. Just try to make it as colorful as possible. Um, and to talk a little bit about what the original has, typically it will have long beans, it will have cucumbers, it'll probably have some cabbage and it will have bean sprouts um, for the vegetables and not these other more colorful ones that I've added in. And then I haven't mentioned yet, I'm gonna show you my face again, um, the proteins that are usually with it. Um, so usually there is hard boiled egg. So I'm gonna include that here. Um, and I think you can't see that, but you will in a second. If you do not eat eggs, you can omit that and use more of the other protein, which we use a lot in this, which is tempeh. So tempeh, I find that people don't know as well as tofu. It's also made from soybeans, but it's made from whole soybeans, which are fermented and formed into these solid blocks or cakes. You can, um, you know, it, it's sold in grocery stores now. Um, you can make your own. I haven't made my own yet, but I, I'm planning to try. And you can either eat it as is, or you can do what I did, which is to toast it in a dry frying pan, so no oil, and just keep it overheat for a few minutes on each side until it's a little bit browned and crispy. I like, I like that texture. Um, so tempeh is very traditional. It comes from Indonesia. Um, and so I'm gonna include that here as well. And so as I mentioned, um, tempeh is a great substitution if you're not using, I'm just gonna actually hold it up for you. If you're not using um, the eggs and want some more protein, tofu would also be great in this if you don't have access to tempeh or, or don't like it, but I encourage you to try it. It has a really nice nutty taste. Um, so that's what the salad looks like, and but it's not complete without a few garnishes and without the dressing. So that's the next thing that I'm going to show you. Give me one second to get some of the stuff out of the way so I have room to show you the dressing. Okay, so the dressing, as I mentioned, or my version of the dressing, um, uses natural peanut butter, meaning uh, peanut butter that's made uh, only with peanuts, maybe a little bit salt, but not with other additives like um, you know, sugar and um, emulsifiers, which uh, other brands will have. You can either get this in one of those places that grinds your peanut butter uh, right there for you in a machine, or just read the labels. Any supermarket will have the kind um, that has just peanuts. Um, 
don't necessarily buy one that says natural, read the ingredients because some of the brands will say natural, but they still have added sugar, um, salt and emulsifiers that you may or, or may not want. Um, so we're gonna put about equal amounts of peanut butter. You can use crunchy or smooth, depending on what you like and what you have. Right now I'm using smooth and coconut milk. So this is, um, you can use light coconut milk or you can use coconut milk, regular coconut milk blended with uh, half and half with water. So not, not too thick and you're gonna stir that in. And this is gonna make a lot of dressing. So this is not just for this small salad today. All right, I'm gonna stir those together. So that's gonna give a nice um, creamy base for this dressing. Um, and I'm just gonna stir it slowly and talk while I'm doing that. So peanuts um, are also a good source of protein and fiber and healthy fats. Um, there are also fats in coconut milk. Um, people always ask, oh, is that bad to be having all that fat? And, you know, the answer is really in, you know, quantity, right? How often are you having it? How much are you having of it? And that makes all the difference. Um, and um, still the fats that are present in these um, being plant-based um, are healthier than the fats that you'll have in the saturated fat from animal products. So I'm going to be slowly stirring this because I think my bowl is a little bit too small for what I uh, want to do today. So peanut and coconut give us the creaminess here. I'll be adding a few other ingredients that go into this very simple dressing that um, really balance each other and um, add, make it really just very, very delicious. Um, so let me speed this up a little bit here, being conscious of time. So that's almost all incorporated. Let me show you some of the other ingredients that go in this. So we have the juice of, depending on how big your lime is, half a lime to a lime. This will add, you know, obviously the lime flavor, but a little bit of acidity to balance out the creaminess. And I'm just going to squeeze that directly into this and stir it in. And you can certainly adjust this to your taste. So there's some lime juice added to our peanut butter and coconut milk. And then I'm adding some low sodium soy sauce. Um, so in my classes and in my cooking, I use low sodium soy sauce because um, soy sauce is one of the condiments with very, very high sodium content, whereas lower sodium versions um, have you know, about half of that amount, um, still very high sodium. So the quantity is important. And then I'm adding a tiny bit of sugar, which is again, just to balance out these flavors here. It's optional. You can use other sweeteners if you want. You can leave it out entirely. And so, you know, we're gonna adjust that to taste. So I'm gonna stir that in. And then I'm gonna show you our final ingredient, which I'd like to put in this dressing, um, which is some freshly grated ginger. So um, looking at the time, I'm gonna to try to do this quickly so I can finish this up, but I wanna show you a technique in peeling ginger that I first learned when I was like seven watching Yan Can Cook from our local friend, Mar Chef Martin Yan, um, which is to peel ginger with a spoon. Any old spoon will do. It, what it does, and I'm gonna show you here, um, is it peels away just the skin and not um, any of the ginger flesh. And it's just kind of fun that you're using uh, a spoon for something like this. So this is something that I remembered from being a young child um, and that I continue doing and I think is a fun tr fun little trick to do. And you know, it's very safe because there's no blade for a child to do. So one of the tips for people who have children in the house um, about getting them to eat more adventurously is get them involved, get their hands involved in the food, get them involved in the shopping, bring them to the farmer's market. Um, so that's it, it's peeled now. I'm gonna show you how I'll grate it into the salad dressing. Um, you know, get them involved in all of those aspects and they'll eat it. It's amazing. No amount of telling them um, what to do is going to accomplish the same as having them actually be a part of the decision making and the making of the food. So I'm using um, this zester. So um, I see that comment there, Carmen. Thank you. I like it. Shoe can cook. 
if anyone is a producer out there, I'd be happy to have a show, just so you know. Um, so, okay, we're gonna grate this. Um, you can use any kind of grater for this. I like this uh, rasp style grater um, because it makes it really fine and it's just really handy to have. And um, you can just basically keep grating away and then just kind of wrap it along the side of your bowl and stir it in. So just to go over those ingredients again, and in real life, we will taste this before I dress it. But peanut butter, light coconut milk, um, a little bit of low sodium soy sauce, um, a little bit of lime juice, a little bit of sugar, optional, um, and then um, some freshly grated ginger. And so all of that together, um, you know, really, gives you this kind of simple and yet complex tasting dressing. And that's kind of the key of all my recipes. Simple to put together, um, inexpensive because plants are less expensive than meat and um, very um, easy to put together. So I'm gonna tilt down a little bit and dress this. Um, so you can either dip or you can drizzle. So I'm just gonna drizzle this over here and then add a few garnishes. Okay, so there's that. Garnishes. Um, traditionally, um, shrimp chips are used as a garnish. So one, besides eating, let me show you my face again, uh, eating the rainbow for nutrition, um, I always say think about presentation, which is also very easy to do when you're using colorful foods. Think about texture. Um, you know, a lot of the health food that um, I saw when I was growing up in the 70s and 80s was kind of bland looking and kind of all pureed and mushy and not very appetizing. So you want crispness, you want crunch. You've got all different textures here because some things are cooked and some things are raw and you definitely get that crunch of the shrimp chips. Um, and the final garnish I'm gonna use is some fried shallots or onions. You can get these, I'm just showing you the package in Asian groceries or you can make your own from um, shallots that you'll slice. And I'm just gonna add these, they add that nice, you know, intensely shallowy oniony flavor and a little bit more crunch here. Um, and so for the things which, you know, I, this may look different and you're having some fried things here from a lot of people's conceptions of healthy food. Um, but I think you'll notice that it's a very, very small proportion of the overall dish. And th this is really the key. Um, it's as long as, in my opinion, as long as you're eating the right things, the healthiest that you can most of the time, um, you can have those, those little treats, whatever it makes to your diet something that you enjoy so that you will eat all these other healthy foods. If it takes a little bit of shrimp chips, if it takes a little bit, and you can substitute rice chips for a vegetarian version, uh, rice crackers, I should say. Um, if it takes a little bit of fried shallots um, to really enhance it, um, then I say go for that. So here's our gato gato, backpackers gato gato. Um, and I think that gives us a few minutes for questions. So um, Anissa, Andrew, or Alan, if you want to read out some of the questions in the chat, I'm happy to answer them. And yes, and then this is where you can follow me on social media. And um, just to let you know, locally, our beloved uh, culinary bookstore, Omnivore Books in Noe Valley, has signed copies. I'm also doing an in-person event, my first in-person event for this, um, August 21st, which is another Saturday. So I'd love to see you there. Um, but you can also get books there. It's also available, of course, at the library and kind of, uh, as they say, anywhere books are sold. Um, so yes, thank you all for coming. Um, Okay, we have lots of questions. Okay. Uh, let's start with, uh, how about what non-animal protein sources would you recommend for older adult nutrition? Could you suggest some recipes for Meals on Wheels to adopt more vegetable forward entrees? Ah, interesting. Ah, I love Meals on Wheels. Um, and um, if, if someone from Meals on Wheels wants to talk to me about that, I'm happy to share my ideas. So, um, you know, in terms of plant-based nutrition, first of all, plants have a lot of nutrition themselves. So you will like broccoli and potatoes. Those are two very common um, vegetables. Both have a lot of protein. Um, legumes in all their forms. So whether it's beans in their many varieties, lentils in their many varieties, or things made out of them, such as the tempeh and tofu made out of soybeans. Um, these are all really great sources of uh, protein um, at any age, including for older adults. Thank you. And I'm gonna combine two questions. Um, basically, 
So there's seven compartments basically in the spice box. What should we be putting in there? You should put what you like in there actually. Um, but if you wanna know some high yield things um, or I guess high yield spices, and I didn't mention that, I, I didn't talk about ginger. So ginger, um, either fresh or in its ground dried form um, is great for your digestion, is great for nausea and is also very um, anti-inflammatory. Ginger is probably a good one to have. You can use it both for savory and sweet things. Um, turmeric is the one that we've studied the most and is available in capsules if you want it that way. Um, um, turmeric is a you know very uh, most studied and very potent anti-inflammatory. It works in your body in a very similar way to ibuprofen and other anti-inflammatories that you might take when you're having um, achy joints or other other pain. Uh, so turmeric is another good one. It's you know you can use it like in a curry or on its own in other ways. Um, Importantly, if you want to get the anti-inflammatory benefit of turmeric, it's much more bioavailable or much more absorbed in your body if you combine it with uh, black pepper. So black pepper would be another great one to have. Um, and then I'll just name one more and then you can, you know, just try different things that you like. Um, one more would be cinnamon. So cinnamon is another, actually I'll say two more. Cinnamon is one which um, adds a lot of um, sweetness. And so I'd like it um, in, for people who are cutting back on added sugar because it's actually very sweet. You don't need as much sweet sweetener added, um, but it also lowers your blood sugar and can help lower your blood pressure. So lots of medical properties there. And then the last one I'll mention, cause I use it a lot and it's used a lot in the recipes in this book is cumin. So cumin, um, you know, besides having a great earthy flavor um, is a source of iron and also um, aids in digestion. And so um, I think that, that would be a good starter for your spice boxes. Thank you. Cumin is my favorite. I love it. Great. Um, let's see. So we do have one question about um, microwaving your vegetables. Do you think that's a bad idea? Okay. Yeah, that, that comes up a lot. And I think it's, it's not, it's not a bad idea because um, they, they do sell steamers um, to use in microwaves, or you can just microwave them without any water. The benefit of using a microwave is that you can cook very quickly. So one of the things that I said is the shorter duration of cooking time um, will preserve more the nutrients. Um, and so I think that if that is a convenient way for you to prepare your vegetables, go for it. Perfect. Um, I think we have another question about um, substituting uh, peanut allergies. For having a peanut allergy, what can we substitute for the sauce? I would use, um, as long as you can have seeds, um, which most people who have peanut allergies can have, use sun butter for this. It'll taste slightly different, but um, it's pretty much the same um, idea and consistency. So sunflower, sunflower seed butter would be great in this. Perfect. Um, what about the difference in taste between long beans and string beans for the recipe? Almost the same, actually. I, I really think that you can substitute, substitute them equally, um, but I just think it's fun to introduce people to vegetables that they may not be familiar with, and I love the way the, the long beans look, but you could totally use any string beans. Um, and I think there might be one about um, plant-based uh, meats or Impossible Burger, maybe using that as a substitute for one of your proteins in the salad. Um, so traditionally, the salad actually doesn't has either tempeh, tofu, or and or hard-boiled eggs. It doesn't usually have meat. Um, so you you could though if you want to, you know have that, but I might just have it on the side instead if that's something that you wanted to eat. Um, but this is actually, aside from the colorful vegetables, uh, pretty faithful to the original salad. But yeah, I would say eat, eat what you like. <laughs> Wonderful. And let's see, um, there's, uh, you suggested Trinidad type of cilantro. Where did you get that? Okay. Um, so uh, that is called, in the, in the cookbook, it's called culantro. Um, and you can get it in um, some like Latin American groceries and also in Asian groceries um, and at the farmer's market. It will be sold under different names. Um, culantro is the you know, Latin American name for it and that's also used in the Caribbean. Caribbean markets also, uh, which we don't have too many of here, will sell it. Um, in an Asian grocery, um, Oh, now I'm just blanking on the name. Give me a second to look it up again. Sorry about that. Um, it is uh, used in Vietnamese cooking a lot. Um, in English, it's actually called sawtooth leaf, but I rarely see it 
um, sold under that name. Uh, the name that you'll see in that's used um, in Vietnam is um, is no guy, which I may not be pronouncing correctly. It's also sometimes called in the Caribbean um, Shadow Benny or Bandania. Um, so there are many names for it. Um, so I think you will have to probably go to one of these more specialized markets. So either um, a Latin American market, Asian market, or a Caribbean market, or uh, to one of the herb vendors in the farmer's markets. You can get them there. If you can't get it, um, you can substitute regular cilantro. It, it doesn't taste exactly the same, but it would be fine. Wonderful. Um, I think there might be one question also about the sauce. Um, how, what about think, substituting the fresh ginger for powdered ginger? Yeah, you can do that. If, um, you know, fresh ginger is something that you don't normally, you know, eat enough of to keep around in your refrigerator, powder would be fine. I would just start with a little, you know, so when something is uh, dried and then powdered, it's, it's going to be a little bit more potent. Um, and then add it to taste. You know, some people love the taste of ginger. I do. Some people don't like it as much. I definitely would include some ginger in it, but, you know, adjust it accordingly to how, you, how ginger you like things. But ground would be fine. Perfect. I think we're going to take one last question. I see there's one about uh, sprouted tofu, tempeh, and whole edamame beans. Which one might be nutrient dense for this recipe? Um, all of them would be actually. So the sprouting, um, you know, enhances the nutrition and and eases the digestion of any of these. Um, but they would all be great, actually. Yeah, so edamame would be a nice addition to this. Not traditional, but again, it, it doesn't have to be. Um, really, so any of those plant-based proteins would be fine in this. Um, but, and again, something from the soybean family is more traditional, typically with tempeh as the most common one. Perfect, let me see. I'm just looking at the chat really quick. Um... Uh, let's see. Dun, dun, dun. I think that might be the majority of the questions. Great. Um, and then let's let's hold on one second. I'm sorry, I did accidentally move on to answer that wasn't, which is, um, do you have any suggestions for those who can't tolerate high fiber foods like beans but want to eat healthy? So that, that question, so with beans, there are, it may or may not be the fiber. For some people, it's the fiber. Um, for others, it actually might just be, um, you know, a cooking technique, which I, I go over in the book about making beans more digestible and breaking down some of the starches. It's actually a particular starch. Um, so taking a note from, um, you know, using herbs and spices for that. Um, uh, you, if you cook with uh, certain herbs and spices, that will reduce the gassiness and that might help you digest, might digest them. Um, examples of those, um, and I just actually wanna open to that section. I know we're running out of time. From the book where I list those because I think that's gonna be helpful to many of you. Um, give me one second here. Okay, we're almost there. Because I think it's gonna um, help a lot of people who think they can't eat beans. Um, bean cooking techniques. So one that I want to go over um, is uh, for spices, um, anise, aniseed, coriander, cumin, um, asafoetida, ginger, and fennel are spices that can reduce the gassiness of beans and, and help you digest them. For herbs, epazote, which is sold in Latin American markets as a fresh or dried herb, a little bit of that can help um, with digesting beans. Um, and then from Japanese cuisine, kombu or kelp can also help with digestion. So I wanted to share those with you. Uh, and then there are other techniques that you can read elsewhere about soaking and then discarding the soaking water, um, boiling with baking soda, which uh, might change the texture and taste a little bit. Um, that can help uh, get rid of some of the gassiness of digesting beans. Um, so I think that answers half of that question. If it's fiber though, um, and fiber, you know, in general, that's difficult. My general um, statement would be, you know, cooked versus raw might be easier for you to digest. And then when you're adding more fiber to your diet, um, just taking your time with it. Don't like suddenly go from never eating vegetables to eating 
all of them every meal. Your body needs time to actually change its um, gut bacteria that will help digest your food. So slowly integrating that over time, you'll, you may or may not be, hopefully be able to digest a little bit better. Thank you. All right, that was so wonderful. Thank you, Linda. We totally appreciate you being here today and such a wonderful answering all of the questions. And folks, I put the um, it last in the chat box, the link to today's events, which has the links to all of the things we hit on, um, links to library news, links to Linda's books and to her upcoming event at Omnivore. Check out the book, buy the book. I, there's, it's on hold right now. You have to place it on hold at our library. So that's good and bad, but <laughs> we're happy to see that there's over 50 holds on the book. So yay. Um, but go check out. And I noticed you're going to be in combo with Terry Bryant, with Bryant Terry. Yes. Awesome. He yes. is so amazing too. I love him. Yes. So that is a double win for going to see that live event. It might be the best event in San Francisco in August, I'm thinking. <laughs> yeah, I think you might be right. I think you might be right. Well, all right, thank friends. you all so much for hosting me and thank you for everybody for coming. I'm, I'm really glad that you spent this time with me today. Thank you so much, Linda. And thank you, Alan, for helping out today too. And Liberty community, we'll see you soon.